Hello everybody, welcome to Sunday Morning Science. John Perry here. Normally I do this live, and as I'm doing it live, I'm reading comments and going back to my presentation, and reading comments, going back to my presentation, and it's kind of a, I get kind of jarred. And so today I'm trying something different. I'm doing a YouTube premiere. So I've actually pre-recorded this. I'm actually recording Saturday night at like uh, 1.39 in the morning, and I'm going to broadcast this tomorrow at 10. Sunday morning. And if you're watching it as I'm broadcasting, you, you can actually uh, talk to me in the comment section. I'm going to be there live watching this with you. So uh, that's that's what I'm doing. I'm trying this out to see if this works better. Let me know if you like that better or if you'd rather me do these live. Doing it live, I can actually like respond to your questions by talking to you. So maybe you like that better. Maybe you think it's fine for me just to respond in the comments. So we'll see. Today's topic is something that we have talked about before, and I've definitely talked about it on my Stated Clearly channel. I've, I've done an animation on it, and it's the evolution of snake venom. But I want to talk more as well about the snake venom delivery system, so the fangs and the, the venom gland and so on, which is something that I haven't talked about a whole lot. This topic was inspired by a question that I got from a friend of mine. We were emailing back and forth, and he is a chemist. He prefers not to be named. I will call him Jim. And uh, he asks, how do entirely new complex systems evolve? And do we understand the evolution of new systems at the chemical level? So chemical reactions, changes in DNA. I am a chemist, and this is what I need in order to really understand evolution. And so I asked him what he meant by a uh, you know, complex system. And he said, you know, something like the immune system versus the digestive system, anything along those lines. I don't want changes within a system. I want the emergence of an entirely new system. How do new systems evolve, and how does this happen at the chemical level? And he was saying that he, he's asked a lot of people about this, and they haven't been able to answer him. And I find that a little bit surprising. We actually know quite well, first of all, how new systems evolve. And we know quite well how evolution works at the molecular level. And so I'm kind of surprised that he hasn't been able to find answers to this. But maybe it's just someone not really being able to put it all together in a form that he likes. Hopefully he'll be okay with, with what I've prepared for him today. But Jim, just so you, uh, so you know, I've got this paper right here. Not that one. This one. It's actually a chapter from a book called The Molecular Basis of Mutation. And this talks about the actual chemistry that's happening when a mutation occurs. And I recommend that you read this. I don't want to go over the details of this because in biology, we don't focus on this a whole lot. What we're mainly looking at is patterns in nucleotide sequence that can tell us what type of mutation happened. You know, all this research at, on how mutations actually happen, this has already been done. You can read about it in books like this and then the papers that this chapter is, is based on. But for the most part, when we're looking at evolutionary changes, we just want to know, oh, was it a point mutation that caused this? Was it a gene duplication? What type of gene duplication caused it? And so on and so forth. So we don't actually normally focus on the actual chemistry that's happening. And I'm not going to do that here in this video. So I'm, I'm linking you to this so you can read about that on your own because that seems to be the level that you're really curious about. I'm going to be talking about the evolution of snake venom, but I'm going to be talking about it at the level of mutations. So what types of mutations happened to produce this system? What do we know about those mutations and so on? I'm not going to show the actual chemical reactions that happened. So some of the mutations happened through gene duplication and those duplications were caused by enzymes and there's a couple of different enzymes that could have caused them and there are signatures in the mutation that we you know, in the gene sequence that can actually tell us what type of enzyme uh, was involved, whether or not it was a normal enzyme uh, during cell replication, or if it was the act of a, of a virus, or what's called reverse transcriptase. We can actually tell that by looking at genes. But I'm not going to go into anything deeper than that in this video. Something that I should be really clear about is that, for the most part, we have a really good understanding of how new proteins evolve, how new molecules evolve through mutations and so on. But it's a lot more difficult to figure out how new structures evolve in animals. So three-dimensional structures that are multi-celled. This is because there are so many different chemical signaling pathways that happen. And we just haven't really worked out all of the details of it. There are exceptions to this. So in dogs, we're understanding really well 
how different mutations happen. I've got some dog skulls here with very different morphologies, and we know how this happens. We know the mutations that are involved, and we know a lot of the chemistry involved in this. We know what's happening. In, in the case of this dog, it's got a flat nose here. It's actually curved down, and the top of the skull is growing faster than the bottom of the skull, and we know the mutation that causes this, and we know how that mutation happened. through. It was through a normal error that happened during uh, meiosis. So we know, we know the actual cause of the mutation. Even greater detail than that, there are actually some aspects of this. Like We know the mutation that causes this, and we know what's happening, morphologically what's happening, but we don't know chemically what's happening in the bone to cause it to, to cause the top to grow faster than the bottom. But we do know chemically what's happening, and at the gene level and everything, for uh, wiener dogs, why wiener dogs have short legs. We do know that, and I've got a little visual aid for you. Hold on one second. This here is Zoe. She's my dog. <laughs> she is a wiener dog, a long-haired Dotson, and she has stubby little legs, as you can see, and if you notice, her ribs and most of her body, I mean, she's small. She's smaller than like a wolf would be, obviously, but her bones are mostly proportional. It's only her legs that are affected by the mutation that she has that causes her to be so small. Um, her breed is not super long like some wiener dogs are. There's actually a different mutation that causes the, the uh, extra long body, and it also causes uh, back problems. So uh, luckily she does not have that, and hopefully she won't get back problems because that's, <laughs> that's a problem with this breed. But she does have the mutation that shortens her long bones in her body and how it does that. I'm going to I'm going to say goodbye Zoe. Say goodbye to the nice people on the internet. <laughs> the mutation that causes her stubby legs, which by the way is actually an advantage for hunting small animals. They were bred for hunting badgers, getting down in the uh the uh the trenches and chasing badgers out of their dens. But the mutation that they have exploits the the growth of long bones. So the long bones of the arm, we have, humans have long bones in the arms, legs, um, hands, and the uh, collarbones. Dogs don't have an ossified collarbone in the same way that humans do, so her mutation does not affect her collarbones, but her mutation affects all long bones in her body. And if you were to take a long bone out of your arm, you would see that on the tip here, there's a little scar on the bone. And that scar is where your growth plate used to be. Long bones become long by rapidly growing in this little plate of cartilage that's on the end of the bones when you're still developing. That thing rapidly grows and then it ossifies as it grows. And so it's constantly growing and constantly ossifying uh, behind the growth plate. And What's happened in Dotson's is a gene that is in charge of ossification has been duplicated and it's producing too much protein. Well, more than it does in, in a wolf, say. And because of that, the ossification happens so fast that the actual growth plate ossifies prematurely compared to other dogs. And you get this, the bones stop growing early and they stay small. So that's what's happening in a Dotson. And we understand that mutation completely, like inside and out. And there's a paper that I've got on that as well, which you can check out. And it mostly talks about the mutation that causes the back problem in Dotson's, but it also talks about the one that causes the shortening of the legs. Uh, the, the one that causes the back problems actually causes the legs to get even shorter. So dogs that have the normal leg shortening gene and the back problem gene, they have extra stubby legs and extra long backs and back problems. Zoe supposedly only has one of these, the, uh, the mutation on the CFA18, which causes her, her legs to be stubby. So anyway, all of that was to say that, for the most part, morphology mutations are not well understood, except for in model animals like rats and fruit flies and dogs. They're actually not even very well understood in humans. So when we talk about the evolution of a system and we want to know how it evolved at the level of chemistry, to really get good answers, you're, go you're gonna wanna look at a system that's got a lot of proteins in it. And the venom delivery system is a good one because venom itself is mostly proteins, right? And so we know very well how those proteins evolved. We don't know as well at the chemical level how snake fangs evolved, 
but I'm going to show you some really nice morphological work on fangs, which will give you a really good idea as to, you know, what exactly is going on here. So this is biologist Andrew Dorso. He works at the University of Geneva, and he got his PhD at Utah State University, and he has a, he has a really cool blog about snakes. He studies snakes. And this is actually, obviously this is not the primary literature, but he, uh, he does a really good summary of the primary literature. So if you want to look at the actual research that he's summarizing here, there's this paper here, Viperous Fangs, Development and Evolution of the Venom Canal. But what I, I really want to show you here in his blog, he has really nice images of a snake fang close up. And you can see that it, it acts as a hypodermic needle. The venom gland, the empties into a hole at the front of the fang. That venom goes through the fang and out a hole in the tip. So it's a true hypodermic needle. This is a really, really cool structure. And the paper he summarizes is talking about how the heck this thing evolved. It turns out that there are lots of snakes. There are lots of snakes that are mildly venomous, but don't have true fangs. Here's an example of one of them. Instead of having true fangs in the front of their mouth, they've got a bunch of little fangs, either in the rear or in the middle in this case, that have grooves on the side. And they have saliva that's slightly toxic. And when they attack their prey, they actually chew on them. And that saliva gets injected, not really injected, it gets slowly chewed into the wound and can then start having the uh, venomous effects that venom has on animals. So there's a lot of snakes that don't have any venom at all and don't have fangs that are like this at all. There's snakes like this that have sort of toxic saliva, and then there are venomous snakes that have extremely toxic saliva and actually inject it through a needle-like tooth. Now, you can't see it in this picture. There are other pictures if you look up uh, rear fanged snake skulls, you'll find pictures where you can actually see that there's little grooves on the sides of these teeth. They're not hollow, but there's grooves on the sides. And when we look at embryology, when we look at snake fangs, true snake fangs develop in embryos, we see that they go through a grooved phase. They go through a grooved phase like this, and then that groove completely closes and ends up turning into a tube. From this, we can deduce that in the evolutionary history of the snake fang, this is the pathway that it took. Snakes with mildly toxic saliva were chewing on their food. They eventually evolved teeth that would fold these little grooves, like we see in rear fanged snakes today. And eventually, as the saliva got more venomous, snakes that happened to have that, that groove completely closed had an advantage over those that had just the groove because they could actually inject it into the victim and really get a lot of that in there really potently. And so that appears to be the evolutionary history for snake fangs. We unfortunately do not have the transition of this happening in the fossil record. We have some really old venomous snake fossils, but they're already fully closed. And if we go back further in time, we find some that are just have normal teeth. We don't have the transition for snakes. We haven't found a good enough lagerstätten, a good enough fossil record that preserves those and that in the right time period to show us a transition. But we do have this for several types of reptiles. There are extinct reptiles, they're, uh, they're venomous. I'll put a link to this in the video description, the paper about this. There are venomous reptiles that also have fangs and we do actually catch the evolution of their fangs in the actual fossil record and it happens just like this. It starts out with a groove and that groove gets closer and closer to a funnel and you've got a full on legitimate fang. So morphologically, we understand how this system evolved. Genetically, we don't. Not the, not the tooth folding, we don't. We do know a little bit about the, the chemistry that's happening in the movement of the fangs to the front of the mouth. All snakes, even front fanged snakes, they start out with their fangs in the rear of the mouth when they're developing as embryos, and then it moves forward. And we actually do know some of the chemistry causing that. And you can read about that in this paper here, Evolutionary Origin and Development of Snake Fangs. So that's a, a good one for you to check out if you're extra interested in chemistry. Now, I already hinted at this before, but snake venom in the venom gland itself is a modified saliva gland. A sp specific saliva gland called the, <laughs> I have trouble pronouncing this, the Dervanois gland in non-venomous snakes. So here we have a picture of a non-venomous snake. Uh, this might be a little bit weird to look at, but here's the eye. The front of the snout would be over here. 
and the scales and skin have been taken away uh, so we can see this salivary gland right here this big fat gland right here and this is a gland that excretes fluids when a snake is biting down and that that helps snakes swallow their food it, it's saliva you know snakes have lots of different salivary glands in their mouths just like we do we actually have hundreds in our mouths some of them are very very small and the same is true with snakes but this gland right here is the one that eventually evolved into a venom gland in venomous snakes. And in uh, rear fanged snakes, this is mildly venomous. It's mostly producing saliva, but it's, some of that saliva has been converted into venom. And in venomous snakes, it's producing still some saliva, but mostly venom. Things that, um, proteins that just, <laughs> when they get into your body, they wreak havoc. So this is very important to note. This is an entirely new system, the venom gland system but it evolved from one of the salivary glands in snakes. This is how new systems evolve. They almost always evolve from a system that's either been duplicated. Snakes have many different salivary glands, meaning that one of them can easily develop a new function without hurting the you know, salivary system. And the other way that uh, complex new systems evolve is that an environment renders some old system useless. And so that's now free to evolve a new function. So those are kind of the two ways in general that new systems evolve. At this point, you're probably wondering how did the actual toxins evolve? There are all sorts of really spectacular molecules in snake venom. It's being studied for medicine. We actually use uh, snake venoms as medicine. There's, I don't think it's being used anymore, but there was, there was one for heart disease that was derived from snake venom. And there's a bunch of other ones that are coming on the market that come from venoms. Really, really cool, sophisticated proteins that interact with our biology extremely efficiently in the venom gland. So where the heck do those come from? Turns out I actually made an animation about this. It's called, How Does New Genetic Information Evolve? Part 2, Gene Duplications. And it focused on the evolution of one of the venom proteins that's found in snakes. And I'm just going to play this for you because I already made it. And it's good. It's better than me rambling here, so. Now for an exciting yet slightly disturbing example, the evolution of snake venom. Genes inside the saliva glands of most creatures, humans included, produce special proteins that are able to start breaking down food on a chemical level even before it gets to the stomach. Venomous snakes, however, have taken this a step further. Their saliva glands produce venom, a cocktail of proteins and other molecules that kill their prey when injected. Let's see how one of these deadly proteins evolved. Many people assume that blood clots form when cuts are allowed to dry in open air. Amazingly, clots actually form through a series of chemical reactions that can quickly seal a wound, even underwater. This ability is possible in part because of a protein called factor 10. It's found in the blood of many animals including fish, frogs, snakes, birds, and people. Factor 10 normally exists in a dormant or sleeping state, drifting about the bloodstream with no effect. If a blood vessel is cut, however, chemicals of the damaged tissue activate factor 10 at the scene of the injury. Factor 10 then initiates a series of chemical reactions, causing a clot to form and seal the wound. The saliva of the Australian rough-scaled snake is loaded with pre-activated factor 10 proteins. If a snake bites an animal, injecting its saliva directly into the wound, rapid clotting occurs throughout the victim's body, the result is often death. When scientists look at the genes that code for this venom, they see clear signs that the snake's very own factor 10 gene, the one that it uses in its own blood, was copied through a duplication event. After, or possibly during duplication, mutations in and near the new gene caused it to produce factor 10 protein in the venom glands instead of the blood. As time went on, small mutations built up in the duplicated gene, making it more and more efficient at its deadly new task. Here we see that a gene once used for healing has now evolved to kill. So to sum things up, how is it that new genes evolve? One of the most important and well understood pathways is for genes to duplicate and then accumulate new mutations. Gene duplications, in combination with simpler mutations like insertions, deletions, and point mutations, are happening naturally, right now, all throughout the living world. With these mutations constantly occurring and constantly filtered through natural selection, there are no limits to the variety of new genetic information, new traits, and new species that evolution can produce. I'm John Perry, and that's how new genes evolve, stated clearly. So there you have it, Jim. That's my cartoon version of how new 
proteins evolved, new snake venom proteins evolved. That's, of course, just one protein. There are hundreds of proteins in snake venom, and a lot of them have similar histories. There was a gene duplication event, and then modifications to that gene through, through normal point mutations caused it to change its function. If you want the less cartoon version of how that protein we looked at in the video evolved, I've got this paper for you right here, and that should answer your question, hopefully. So let me just summarize the hypothesis here, uh, which is backed up by a lot of evidence, quite a bit of evidence, for the evolution of the snake fang venom delivery system. The first thing that happened is we had the evolution of uh, venom, venomous molecules, so molecules that when a snake gets into the blood of its prey, it's going to help kill that prey faster. And this is going to be a benefit to any snake that's struggling with its prey. And that was just evolving in its saliva. And we see this in snakes today. There's many non-venomous snakes that actually do have toxins in their saliva. And these toxins help kill their prey. And we see this especially with the hind-fanged snakes, so-called hind-fanged snakes. They will chew on their prey while they're fighting with it. Chew on it, chew on it, chew on it. Work that saliva in there. And that saliva will actually help subdue the prey. And, you know... A snake that's battling its food, it, it's dangerous. Every time a snake attacks, there's a risk that it's, the snake's going to get killed in this, this attack. So any, any advantage, any mutation, any change in saliva composition that helps the snake win more often is going to be beneficial. It's going to be selected for. Eventually you have the actual forming of grooves in those fangs, which help more saliva get into the wound. Then you have the closing of that groove to form an actual tube, which really helps inject that venom deep into the animal that it's struggling with. And all while that's happening, you can have this slow, gradual buildup of more and more toxins in the saliva until you have a legitimate venom gland. A salivary gland has been transformed into a venom gland. And this is how Complex new systems evolve. This is one example of a complex new system evolving. So there you have it. Hopefully that was helpful. Happy Science Sunday to you all. This was a fun episode to make. Hopefully you liked chatting with me in the comments today instead of doing the live chat like we normally do. I felt like it went a lot smoother. It was a lot easier for me to get through my lesson this way. So long for now. Stay curious. Here's Zoe, you're not bad. Here's Zoe, you see? Come here.